together in Vietnam, and now, years later, their battle continues in Jackknife, one of the four new movies we're going to be reviewing this week, plus a centenary birthday salute to Charlie Chaplin. I'm Roger Ebert of the Chicago Sun-Times. And I'm Gene Siskel of the Chicago Tribune. Our first film is called Jackknife. That was the nickname Robert De Niro's character had during the Vietnam War. Now he's home. The war's been over for 15 years, but it still weighs heavily upon him and even more heavily on one of his platoon buddies played by Ed Harris. De Niro comes to visit him and finds that Harris is a terribly antisocial alcoholic living with and annoying his sister, a high school teacher played by Kathy Baker. He leaves. He went to the car to get beer. Good. I could use one. Oh, I shouldn't think you could stomach it after all you had last night. I work hard all week. I'm entitled to cut loose on the weekends. All three characters have their problems. Kathy Baker's character is trapped at home with her brother. She's attracted to De Niro, but she's very insecure, as is he. I'm not dressed right. I should be dressed better. No, you're fine. Get out much for meals and stuff. Do uh, your girlfriends come over and cook for you? Is that like a like a real question, or are you just jerking my chain? What? No, I. What? Joseph, I'm a little nervous. I was trying to make conversation with you. There is a major conflict between Ed Harris and De Niro over a wartime incident that led to the death of their mutual friend named Bobby. They both owe Bobby something, even as they mourn him. We were going to go fishing. Yeah, I got an opening day. Maybe you're thinking, as I was when this film started, that you've seen all there is to see about Vietnam veterans and their problems. Well, Jackknife proves that even a familiar subject can be enlivened by intelligent writing, equal to the intelligence of the fine actors in this piece. We see that a whole generation of men is still bedeviled by the Vietnam War. We see how their families are afflicted, too, in this case, a sister. And all of this is communicated in a strong love story, actually two of them, between the two fighting men and the story between the man and a woman. That De Niro and Ed Harris are good is no surprise, of course. That Kathy Baker from Street Smart and Clean Sober is superb reaffirms the promise of those earlier roles and marks her as one of the best new faces around today. I was truly touched by Jackknife, and I didn't think I would be. I was touched by it, too, very touched. And I think you're right when you put your finger on Kathy Baker because she is mm -hmm. the emotional center Correct. of the movie. She is this woman who has been kept hostage in this house by her brother, mm -hmm. uh, an alcoholic who is still reliving all of the pain of the war, and who wants her to stay right there and put dinner on the table and make his life simple and give up her own life for that. So De Niro comes in from the outside, really, to liberate both of them from this anger that's been going on for 15 years. This is like The Deer Hunter Part Two in a way. This is kind of second act of those lives that we saw in the movie that De Niro made 10 years ago. What surprises me is, uh, well, I guess what I said before, which is that you kn think you know this mm -hmm. story, mm -hmm. and yet seeing it told again um, makes me realize just how many people are still afflicted. I it's, mean, it's, it's very effective, the scenes where De Niro goes to the veterans groups, for example, yes. the encounter groups, where they talk about the problems that they have, and they, they get it out, and they get it out into the open, and they deal with it and help each other. That is a process, the healing process, mm -hmm. in this movie, and the movie is part of it, I think. Yeah, the, uh, you think back to coming home, but that's uh, a decade ago, and the stories are still uh, can be told and told well. That's right. Next movie. Our next movie is a comic extravaganza named The Adventures of Baron Munchausen, based on the legend of an 18th century baron who could never resist making a good story just a little bit better, sometimes a whole lot better. The movie stars John Neville as Munchausen, who claimed to have gone to the moon, descended into a volcano, and spent a very pleasant few days 
in the stomach of a sea monster. I can always remember my dad reading me this story. Remember where the Baron tied up his uh, horse at night on the little twig in a snowstorm, and in the morning the snow had melted and it's a church steeple? Asked my dad, how's he going to get the horse down? He said, I don't know, he's going to have to wait for another snowstorm, I guess. <laughs> Thanks to some amazing special effects, not to mention a reported budget of $46 million, it looks as if the Baron was telling the truth in all of those stories. Here's the scene where the Baron and his friends fall into a volcano and are surrounded by giants. That is Oliver Reed as the fearsome Vulcan. Still in one piece. I think. I can't imagine what. Oh. Our descent in what I take to be the volcano of Mount Etna should have been slowed by a rising cushion of warm air. The damn thing seems to have out. Oh no. Not more giants. Can I help you, tiny mortal? If we are to believe the Baron, one of his friends could outrace a speeding bullet. This is my favorite scene. Look at the beauty and wonder of the Ark of the Heavens here. This is precisely the sort of thing that no one ever believed. Right, behold. Uh, you go first, then Sally. The Avengers of Baron Munchausen was directed by Terry Gilliam, who loves special effects and used a lot of them in his first two films, Time Bandits and Brazil. In this one, he creates effects so astonishing that sometimes they actually upstage the story. And to tell you the truth, there were times in Baron Munchausen when I couldn't follow the story, and other times when it seemed to move too slowly. Gilliam is stronger on effects than he is on fine-tuning a screenplay. But I like Baron Munchausen all the same, partially because John Neville was so good in the title role, insisting on all those tall tales with such ferocity that you're not even surprised when you actually see them. Now, the film wore me out, too, in the same way that you're talking about, because of the special effects dominating the story. I mean, in this case, a little bit less would have been more. I mean, I... They're fabulous individually, but when they come at you one after another, I think you just whipsaw it all the way through. And so I remember the effects. I don't really, I never got any feeling for the people I involved. I think maybe one of the things that helped me with this movie was that I was familiar with the story of Bear Munchausen right. because it had been read to me so often when I was sure. a kid. I knew I, I could see everything coming. It was like a wonderful illustrated picture. But I think maybe for kids who do really live in the moment in a movie anyway and don't care about the whole sweep of it, uh, it would work the same way. I don't know. It didn't work uh, that well for me only because I think that the, uh, he just, again, even with Brazil, there was just so many special effects that... Uh, Brazil was overkill. Here, at least, there was something to start with. Now, I'm, I'm beginning to think Brazil was even better. Coming up next, John Ritter in Skin Deep, a comedy about a womanizer who also is an alcoholic. How do you feel about that? Like Mrs. Arnold Schwartz. Blake Edwards, who likes to make bittersweet comedies about lust-filled men who also are alcoholics. John Ritter has been improbably cast as lead here, and once his wife finds him cheating, even on the woman that he's been having an affair with, she throws him and her out of the house, and Ritter bounces from bed to bottle to bed, invariably disappointing the women he meets. One of those women gets very angry at his cheating ways. Final man. She gives Ritter an electric wrap treatment with too much voltage. Anything above plus seven could be dangerous. Look above. After a drunken binge, Ritter's bartender pal takes him home to a spare bedroom. Vincent Gardenia plays the bartender. All right, all right. How'd you do? What, what is that? The V12. Do I need it? Did Castro need a bulletproof vest? <laughs> it's not too exciting being wrapped in toilet paper. The scene that the film's ad campaign is built on, the one that you've been maybe hearing about, involves a pair of glow-in-the-dark condoms, one worn by Ritter, another by the boyfriend of the woman Ritter is with in a motel, and we can see the condoms in the dark and night uh, glowing and moving around. A little ballet. Yeah, sort of, yeah. sort of a little ballet. ballet yeah. Right. 
that is a very funny scene. And the advice Ritter gets from his psychiatrist at the end of the film to simply stop drinking as a way of solving his problems is another good scene. But the movie doesn't hang together for me. It's slanted toward lethargic comedy. Ritter seems distracted by what's going on. And after a while, he becomes a bore. Skin Deep finishes strong, but takes far too long to get to the meaty part of its story. I liked it more than you did. And in fact, I like Blake Edwards' this whole quartet of movies that he's made. You can go back to 10. Better film. And that's life. Better film. And Mickey and Maud. Better film. You didn't like Mickey and Maud. Uh, I Mickey caught Maud, you there. Mickey I and Maud, you. I gave four stars to. Well, I'm like you good didn't sense. catch me anywhere. Except very good. <laughs> you sense. caught your own bad memory. You. Very proud of you for having uh, best, one of the best 10 of that year. There. And what he's attracted to in all of these films is basically the same story. A guy who drinks too much who turns his back on the good woman he has at home in order to uh, get into all kinds of trouble with all sorts of other people. In this particular film, yeah. there is an interesting contrast between the very dark bottom of the picture, the, the, that the abyss that, 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 that Ritter me. is falling into, and the slapstick that's going on in contrast to it. The fact that he's trying to get those two notes into the same film is fascinating to me. I think it's a brave attempt. I think that the, the, but he did it better in three other films. I mean, uh, I like the dark side. I wish the dark side had been put in more uh, strongly throughout the whole film rather than just thrown in at the end there. That's the mistake of the picture. I, you see, the thing that I like about Blake Edwards in these films is that what he's basically trying to do is to capture the insanity and the comedy of alcoholism at the same time that he's dealing with the tragedy. Mm -hmm. So often that particular aspect is never captured, but an alcoholic is running out of control like this is going to get into all kinds of bizarre adventures, and that's what the movie is really about. When he's wrapped up in the toilet paper, for example, it wasn't supposed to be funny that he was wrapped in the toilet paper. Mm -hmm. The line is, I was cold, you see, so it's a joke. Yeah, I didn't laugh. When we come back, Chocolat, the story of a French girl who returns to the plains of Africa where she spent her childhood. And later on in our video segment, we'll look at some films of Charles Chaplin, whose 100th birthday is coming up. For Chocolate, it's a moody, evocative film based on the memories of a French woman who spent her childhood in Africa and returns many years later. Most of the film is told in flashbacks, showing the everyday life of a district station in Cameroon in colonial French West Africa, where the girl's French mother, played by Julia Bashi, has a cook who was trained in English cooking and doesn't understand French cuisine. Enoch, finis. Le Yorkshire pudding, la crème renversée, la viande bouillie. Stop, basta, assez. Compris? While the woman's husband is away, an English visitor arrives, and the woman asks Prote, her houseboy, to help her prepare. We sense the tension between them. Aide-moi. All of these scenes are supposed to be childhood memories of that woman's young daughter who, in this scene, learns African words from the houseboy. Bombo. Bombo. Les yeux. Miso. Miso. Uh, le nez. Pemba. Pemba. La bouche. Mudumbu. Les dents. <laughs> La sombra. The African in that scene is played by Isaac de Ban Cal in a very good performance as a quiet, civilized man who tries to be a good servant but feels anger growing within him at the way he's treated and the way the racist colonial society prohibits him from expressing his true feelings. This is a political movie, but the politics are subtle, and the strongest element in the film is its feeling for the land. We hear the absolutely empty quiet of the African plain, and then we become aware of the thousand noises of the night, and we see the beauty of the land that makes all of Africa's peoples fall in love with her, no matter what happens to them there. This is a first feature directed by Claire Dennis, who has made a film that condemns colonialism while still at the same time honoring the nostalgia of a little white girl's childhood memories. I think it's an absolutely superb film. I think it's one of the uh, films that, a uh, few films these days, that shows you what a film can do visually. Mm -hmm. uh, you're quite right that the land is, is the hidden character in this film. Uh, I've been to Africa, I know you have. It mirrors my experience of the quiet that you referred to. Um, there are individual shots here. There's a, a shot of, of the uh, black houseboy welling up with tears that I will never forget. Um, there's a sh uh, the way she frames, Claire Dennis, frames uh, things wide, mm -hmm. rather than the close-ups that we get in most American films that lead you around by the nose, to let us see the land, to let us see the characters, to see how small they are against the land. Shots of ants crossing a table that almost take on a, a human quality in terms of mirroring what we've seen here before. The story is familiar, colonialism, but I don't think I've seen it rendered so beautifully in quite a long 
long time. It is a very beautiful film. Some of the individual shots are like pictures that you could frame. They're beautiful. Uh, one thing that's interesting about the film is that most of the memories in the flashback could not be remembered by the girl. I, you know, She's not there in most of the scenes, and she wouldn't understand other scenes. If I had been Claire Dennis, uh, I'm sure she wants my free advice, I would have left off the framing elements. I don't think you did. I, I agree with you. And just tell the story of what happened uh, in those days because it's complete and it's beautiful and it's very, very effective. At the same time, the opening shots of seeing the girl now and Africa today, if you will, uh, were fascinating. And who, why she, she gets picked up by uh, another black man and who takes her on the trip and she's afraid of him and all that. That, that was interesting. I, she doesn't have the ability to make a bad shot. That's what's so fascinating. Terrific director. Coming up next, April marks the 100th anniversary of Charlie Chaplin's birth. Among a variety of tributes, one of the best is the reissue of fine prints of some of his classic short films. We'll show you what's available for home video use. When all sorts of celebrations are planned, as we in effect celebrate the birth of film comedy, as well as the man who did so much to popularize film going itself. In video stores, Chaplin's feature films will go on sale April 20th in the standard VHS format for the reduced price of 1998. They're from Key Video. Here's a famous scene of Chaplin victimized by a feeding machine in modern times from 1935. Laserdisc from Image Entertainment, many of the short films Chaplin made have been beautifully preserved by David Shepard of the University of Southern California's film department. For example, in 1916, one of Chaplin's choice physical comedies for mutual studios is Fireman, with Charlie playing a late sleeping firefighter who always annoys his boss. A year later, and behind the screen, Chaplin plays a stagehand's assistant who is forever threatening to knock over the camera. As you watch this, think of the newly arrived immigrant masses 70 years ago watching Chaplin act out their frustrations in the workplace. best scene, Chaplin enjoys a lunch break with split-second timing that is his trademark. Chaplin also shows his tender side in the same film, falling in love with another stagehand, a woman in disguise. Notice how Chaplin, who directed this film, uses a tighter shot for these more personal, emotional moments. That's Edna Purviance, his longtime co-star, and what you get from that sequence there is the depth of feeling of Charlie Chaplin. He obviously was more than just a slapstick comedian there. When he turns on the charm and has the kissing sequence there, you really feel it. The soundtrack is added, of course, to the silent films, and again, those films are from the Mutual era, and they're available only on Laserdisc, four to a disc, for $39.95. Now, it's interesting here because we're talking about two different kinds. His feature films, like Modern Times and right. so forth, are out on, on tape for 1995, right. and those right. were available in theaters a few years ago, right. having been restored. What's new, and only on Laserdisc, is the short subjects. Right. And what amazed me in looking at the Laserdisc was the high quality of them, because right. in in my life, I've never seen a Charlie Chaplin short that didn't look as if somebody had dra hadn't dragged it behind a truck for about five miles. They're always scratched, and they're out of focus, and the light goes in and out, and there were dots all over the screen, and they look really crummy. On Laserdisc, these movies look brand new. They look as good as any black and white movie I've ever seen. Yeah. They've been restored so carefully by this man from USC, and that's the discovery here, I think. Well, also the timing. There's also been timing problems in terms of these films with them being printed with uh, speeded-up imagery yeah. and all that, uh -huh. so it just looks like he's running around like a little rat. Uh -huh. 
here the timing is down correctly, and the films look great. It's like Chaplin has been given a whole new lease on life for a new generation. Now let's take another look at the movies we reviewed on this show. Two thumbs up for Jackknife, the aftermath of Vietnam, with fine performances by Robert De Niro, Ed Harris, and Kathy Baker. A split decision on the adventures of Baron Munchausen. We both felt the special effects overwhelmed the story, but that bothered Gene more than me. Another split decision on Skin Deep by Blake Edwards with John Ritter as an out-of-control alcoholic. I like the mixture of slapstick and tragedy. Gene didn't like most of the slapstick. Finally, two very enthusiastic responses to shock a lot. Claire Dennis's memory of a little French girl childhood in Africa. So shock a lot and um, jackknife. jackknife and the Chaplin stuff is really terrific to see it looking so good now. That's right. That's it for this week. Next week we'll be back with reviews of five new movies, including Fletch Live, starring Chevy Chase, and also Leviathan, starring Peter Weller and Richard Crenna. That's next week. And until then, the balcony is closed.